Discord. So as we begin our primary review of content for module three, which would be acquisition, right? Digital acquisition. You're going to apply SA. If you recall anything from our session on Monday, what does SA mean? What does that acronym stand for? Can someone unmute the microphone and tell me? Hello, hello. Can someone unmute your mic just to tell me that your I'm, audio is I'm working? I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember. Okay. So the the best digital forensics tool is located where? The uh, utility suites will come and go, open source products will become commercialized and too expensive, but the best digital forensic asset you have is the one between your ears. It has to do with your powers of observation. SA stands for situational awareness, right? So we're going to invest some quality time in our assignment and, and solution in this module because what we're doing is uh, portraying a scenario and seeing it's, we're presenting an opportunity for you to exercise your situational awareness, your powers of observation, right? You have a baseline of common activity uh, that is generically known. And in one of the scenarios for your solution, it is noted that the IT shop has logged a concern about the workstation. The workstation activity is way beyond the norm. There's a lot of really strong activity, the CPU and disk and network uh, metrics are off the charts. There's something obviously going on with the workstation in the office belonging to Sydney Corinth. Okay. So that's something we want to call out as you take up your review of the criteria for the assignment and solution. Any questions about student learning objective? Bravo. No. So we want you to be able to describe the steps for to prepare for acquisition, including the steps to secure a computer's crime scene. Now we've, you know, we've taken up aspects of this ever since the first day of the first module. You know that um, you may or may not have a witness present when you arrive on the scene as an incident handler or a DEFR. You may have to record the scene. So it's not uncommon to set up a video recorder if you're the one person that's allowed access into an office that's unoccupied. Um, and that's the case here for Sydney Corinth. Another student learning objective is to identify and assess legal and ethical issues that present for a case and recommend suitable actions. Now, as you're working acquisition, suitable actions differ from stage to stage of the digital forensics process. So if you're in incident handling mode, a suitable action might be to recommend an expanded scope of investigation because during incident handling, you discover, oh, this goes beyond what we first suspected, right? So that would mean that you need to get approval from the chain of command to expand the scope because of what was discovered, right? And that means you have to have a general idea of what's legal and ethical and what isn't. You'll see something that you know is just plain wrong and you need to take action appropriately. Any questions about SLO Delta? Nope, seems pretty straightforward. 
Yep. Now you'll need to use the same knowledge and abilities that you picked up in module two. You'll need to list and describe tools used for certain aspects of data acquisition, including any prerequisites and caveats. We covered in our last class, the whole idea of write blocks or read only options, right? So that data isn't corrupted. Given a scenario, compare and contrast digital acquisition tools and methods, select one and use one. Provide best practice criteria and ordered steps to use a tool, right? The idea of hashing before and after. The idea that you use a hashing tool before and after. That you benchmark or certify the proper function of your tools, right? There are digital evidence formats. So when you acquire digital evidence, you can choose to store it in an open format or in a commonly used industry standard format, which is not necessarily an open standard, but it's, it, in some cases it's proprietary. We'll cover that more in detail, but we actually start off our addendum with a review to that effect. We talk about the raw format. Raw is the universal open standard for data acquisition, and you'll have opportunities to capture data raw, but there are also proprietary formats that are recognized internationally in the court systems and in jurisdictions on every level, expert witness compression file format or EWC file formats, NCASE, it's the unofficial standard, right? There's also an AFF file format, same idea. It's a commonly recognized file format. You want to capture data in a format for equivalent comparison. If you capture data in an odd format, you shoot yourself in the foot. You can't, can't duplicate results. And if you can't duplicate results, you can't prove it. You can't validate, verify, and all that business. We touched on metadata and we showed you how metadata can change even though a hash won't, right? So it's important to understand the concept of metadata for a digital file formats and where there's a tipping point in terms of changes. We want you to be able to demonstrate how to validate data acquisitions. And again, our session last, um, in the last class was a bit of a walkthrough on that process on one level with a hashing tool. We will touch on network acquisition tools a bit and explain RAID acquisition methods. You're going to have corporate or organizations. You'll have large organizations uh, that have extensive data storage and you have to be able to acquire the data properly, even though you don't have the capacity to export you know, six petabytes of storage because, because the VI government has uh, a RAID array that's, uh, you know, they have a SAN that's six petabytes large, right? And that's just one quick example. I don't know if the US Virgin Islands government has six petabytes in a SAN. I'm just using it as an example. Common and gifted suspects prevent viewing and access of digital evidence. So finally, as you take up the solution and you begin to investigate the scenario, as you handle the incident, you're gonna to wanna to have a view or an understanding of what common suspects and gifted suspects, two different tiers or levels, your average computer user and your skilled computer user do to obscure evidence, to hide evidence, right? So in this particular case, the image is a little better here. When we install NCASE, 
or we install FTK, the one of the things that poses a challenge is that some of our workstation security, like Windows Defender, uh, incorrectly flags this as a potential security problem, threats found. Can everybody see this? I know it's really kind of small, but. Kinda. Kind of, yeah. So when you're using uh, certain open source tools in particular, uh, it'll, it'll trigger some of those tools and then uh, flag them as malicious, potentially malicious. You have to, depending on the settings of your local workstation security, you may have to take them out of quarantine if they're automatically quarantined. They won't work properly. So one of the things that can happen when you're working with forensic tools is that you can, if you're not careful, alert a suspect in a case that a recording is being attempted, right? So as you, does everyone recall what happened in the intro to cyber course last season where you were supposed to leave no trace but then somebody left a trace? Yep. Okay. That's the same idea there. So our forensic tools used by malicious actors as much as DEFR or DES, not really, they're used a whole lot more. So malicious actors tend to practice their craft a whole lot more than uh, forensic experts. They're very, very good at using tools and in particular, using those same tools to create a false impression or to cover their tracks. We've already covered how important it is to validate and verify your tools constantly, right? One aspect of data acquisition is a comprehensive understanding. One prerequisite of being effective in this area is working with file systems. And one of the things that comes back over and over again are older file systems, older computer systems, tablets, and devices um, tend to default to older style uh, file formats. And FAT16, FAT32, these are older, these are older computer uh, operating system file formats. And one thing you need to become is basically a subject matter expert on disks, uh, hard disks, and, and, uh, and then storage volumes, logical volumes, partitions, uh, file allocation tables, and so on. So that's what FAT stands for, file allocation table. In the earliest versions of Windows and DOS, uh, file allocation table was the common file system used by the operating system in order to store data. But on a Mac, it's APFS. On Linux systems, it's EXT4. These are journaled file systems. We cover what journaling in an operating system involves in the 410 class. You have to be able to know how to work your way around different file formats and to be able to work in that environment in order to use those tools. So there are challenges at times depending on the platform. And that's one thing that you have to be comfortable with. Encryption is another emerging challenge with incident handling. Whenever you encounter encryption, you have to be able to start your process with a view of, okay, what tools were used, what encryption, what type of encryption is this? Uh, you know, do we have the keys on hand and so on? You have to be able to quickly assess the scenarios where encryption is in the mix. And that can be very unfortunate depending on how your gifted uh, adversaries are, are working the process. So some use third-party tools, some do not. 
So true or false, you need to have Windows to encrypt your local files and you have to have a professional edition to encrypt your local files. True or false? Hello. What do you think? False. False is correct. You have a variety of options to encrypt, right? And there's very, very simple methods that can be very profoundly frustrating. Um, how many of you knew that you could password protect? You could password protect a document. I can. So you can. You can work. You can sign a document. You can secure a document. You can password protect a document. Um, these are things that tend to profoundly frustrate people. If you're using a PDF, you can password protect a PDF. And that's not the same as encryption, but it means that you know the contents may or may not be accessible depending on the tools that you're using. So how many of you have heard of PGP? Has anyone heard of PGP? No, no, I don't think I have. That sounds like a new term. Okay. Let's look at PGP. Open PGP is the most widely used email encryption standard, right? It was created by Phil Zimmerman. Is PGP used today? It's almost impossible to hack. That's why it's still used by entities that send and receive sensitive information such as journalists, right? So essentially, PGP is open source. Pretty good privacy is what the acronym stands for. Hashing, data compression, symmetric key cryptography, public key cryptography, so both asymmetric crypto, you have public and private keys with public key cryptography. You also have symmetric key or what's called secret key cryptography. Right. When we say fingerprinting, we're talking about um, you are sharing your public key. And I've seen this. I've actually been at SANS conferences and I meet some of the SANS instructors for a given certification for their boot camps. And on the back of their business card, they have this printed. And when everybody sees this, they say, oh, that's a, that's a public key fingerprint. It's a shorter version of the public key. So what you're doing is giving your public key to somebody with the understanding that you may be sending them secret information that's encrypted with their private key. Okay. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? Kind of, sort of, maybe. Yeah, I'm following. Okay. Yeah, so, so. so if you see something like that stored in a text file on a suspect's machine, get ready. It means that PGP may be in the mix or that your suspect, the person of interest, could be using PGP with someone else. They're either using it themselves or they're collaborating with someone else to protect information or to obscure the access to information, right? So this is a good thing to be up on. And in the interest of time and sanity in this course, we, we can't go into specifics, but a special topics course in cryptography 
would teach you how to use this, work this, and become an expert with uh, every form of, you know, encryption, cryptography, digital signatures, the whole nine yards. So if any of you are completing your cybersecurity concentration and you'd like to consider a special topic in cryptography, uh, I happen to have completed advanced studies in that particular field and I'd be ready to provide that as a special topic for our students. It's just a thought. Any questions, comments, thoughts? about encryption before we move on. And we mentioned earlier in the course that another emerging challenge with incident handling is being able to deal with the newer styles and formats for flash memory. We're talking about, um, hang on just a second. Uh, everybody hold off just a moment, please. Yeah. Here. Okay, so this is something we mentioned earlier in the season. An emerging challenge with incident handling is that every time you turn around, there is a new yet another format of flash memory. M.2 was the initial... Uh, all right, so, so there are distinctions between M.2, EMMC, uh, NVMe. So you have to be up to speed with uh, what conventions and standards are, are currently in play, but you also have to have the capacity to work with older style formats as well. Now, in particular, solid state or flash memory drives the data that's in there, the temporary data that's in there is very fragile because the efficiency algorithms used to optimize read and write, um, it's called wear leveling, that tends to overwrite the data. So unless you're very fast, unless you perform immediate capture and backup of data for deleted, for deleted files I'm talking about, this is, almost as critical as capturing page file memory. So page file memory is temporary disk memory where the contents of RAM are stored uh, while your machine is multitasking. Does everybody, has everybody seen something or had exposure to page file memory? We actually expose you to a bit of this when we go into the optimizing your personal technology, does everybody remember optimizing your personal technology? At the beginning of the semester, we ask our students to optimize their personal technology. I need to hear something. Can someone unmute their mic? Hello. Okay. You do a, you perform a disk cleanup after you remove unknown or no longer used apps. You run update, you, you run updates on your operating system in your apps. Then you perform disk cleanup then disk defragmentation. Then you adjust the settings for your virtual memory. That's page file memory. Can everyone see how I have manually modified the settings for my page file memory on my laptop? I want it to match the amount of RAM or if I have less RAM and I have more hard disk space, I can double or triple the minimum size and the maximum size. What this does is it's, it sets aside a dedicated portion, a contiguous portion if I do, if I prepare my machine correctly, where all of the contents of my RAM are written to temporarily 
while I'm multitasking or juggling, right? In most cases, operating systems automatically manage page memory or page file size. And this can be a challenge, you know, depending on the system and what you're doing. Are there any questions about this particular aspect of review? Now, what's most volatile is the contents of RAM. So that's that would be the extreme case. So when you're talking about situational awareness, a baseline would be, okay, when someone's away at a conference and their workstation is sitting unattended in an office, what kind of baseline would you expect? If they did not have to work remotely, what would you expect their computer to exhibit for activity? Ordinarily, if you're working with an organization that's concerned about conserving energy, being efficient, being green, not wasting things, what would you expect to find in an office where someone is away for a week, out of the area for a week, to attend a conference? What would you expect of their office machine? What kind of activity would you expect to see or witness in an environment that's concerned with energy conservation and keeping their power bill down? No activity. Say again. No activity. No activity is correct. I would expect it would even be powered off, right? I would expect that a workstation that's sitting for a week unattended where people are not required to work remotely. Yeah. The, I mean, why would they have to have their office machine if they have what they need with their laptop, right? So those are things that we mean, you know, baseline is not just what happens with task manager, right? It's not just task manager. Baseline is a generic reference to what the normal activity or established expectation is. So if you walk into a situation where there's an obvious departure from that, as you start to investigate, you always wanna keep in mind means, motive, and opportunity. So as you investigate a suspect and their systems and devices, one of the important aspects of digital forensics is to keep an open view of, of that uh, scenario. And if in particular, the situational awareness speaks to a conflict, a dissatisfied employee, um, those, are, those are things that start to key in or indicate that you might have a disgruntled employee that's taking action. And what you want to do as you're collecting digital evidence is to view that through the lens of whether or not a specific digital artifact would provide for it would it would involve the means to perpetrate a certain crime or violate a specific policy if a digital artifact indicates or reflects a matter of motive right so a lot of times when you're interpreting digital artifacts and evidence as you're assessing the scenario, does it, does it reflect uh, the opportunity to perpetrate something that's unauthorized? Having a workstation that's powered on, that's forced to remain in, you know, the power save options are disabled. It's neither sleeping nor hibernating. A workstation where the power save options have been modified would present the opportunity to access digital records in the office after hours, when you're no longer in the office, when you're not working, you're not even, you're not even participating in the work schedule that week on site, but it would provide the opportunity. What do I mean? 
ordinarily in a organization where operating green is important, power options should be set to conserve power, right? But if they're modified, if they're hardwired on so that the office machine is plugged in and the hard disk never turns off and it never goes to sleep and the processor power management is cranked up, right? That would, that would represent uh, a matter of digital evidence that speaks to opportunity because somebody who wants to perpetrate unauthorized access has to keep the darn system running in order to access it remotely. Is this a sensible explanation of what we mean by means, motive, and opportunity? So the context of the investigation, the scope is critical. There's no textbook that can, there's no formula where you can just uh, regurgitate some facts. This is interactive. And this is where digital forensic uh, first responders, DEFRs and digital evidence specialists earn their money, right? It's your wits, it's your powers of observation, right? You're expected to recall all of this. We've, we've discussed some of this from earlier modules. Now, one new distinction is to understand that not all evidence is data or digital. Sometimes it could be something as simple as, um, it could be as something as simple as uh, this piece of equipment is unplugged or, or this cable is attached. It may or may not be powered on, but the fact is there could be physical evidence in the scenario that's not, it's physical evidence. It's the state of the office. It's whether or not um, a person is logged in, right? So if somebody is logged in and the screen is locked, that means that you have an active login in a sense, that's physical evidence because when you approach the screen, it shows that there's a screensaver and so-and-so is logged in and you know, you touch the, you move the mouse so that the screensaver deactivates and it's prompting for the user's login. That means there's an active login, right? So you all know the difference between signing out. So you can, you can sign out, you can switch user. Switching users can be very confusing for a scenario. So somebody could be logged in temporarily and uh, that's something that has to be intentionally set. You have two types of acquisition process. And this is where uh, we get to be really intentional about uh, incident handling. So what I'd like to do is take just a short break. Everybody stretch 30 seconds, we'll pause, right? And then we'll come right back. I want everybody to take a moment and then uh, we'll talk about these two types of acquisition process. Everybody back? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in the data acquisition process or phase, there's actually two main, two main stages or types of acquisition. There's live acquisition. That's chapter 11 in your textbook and static acquisition. So when you're working static acquisition, the physical evidence has already been collected, cataloged and secured by other qualified individuals at selected locations. And so what you're doing is you're working what has been collected to create forensically sound copies of the digital evidence so that, so that uh, the analysis can begin, right? So hopefully when the live acquisition occurred, hopefully it was objective and impartial, right? So 
that's an that's an aspect of record keeping that you want to be able to demonstrate or speak to if things go to court. So that's where having a witness, you know, you don't want to be working evidence collection by yourself in a closed room behind a closed door and you're not a part of the organization and nobody's witnessing anything you're doing. You want someone to uh, participate in the process, to witness the process. And if they can't, you want to record the process. Physical evidence includes the state of a system when data was collected, whether the system was powered on, asleep, and hibernation, the status of network activity upon arrival, right? So if you approach a workstation and it appears to be powered off, you might want to take pictures or video of the back of the system because you might see a blinking network light, right? Which may or may not indicate network transmission or uh receiving you know it doesn't mean that it's transmitting or receiving but it may mean that uh there's a live network connection whether the system is powered on or not that's an important aspect to to document right if you find out that it's been blinking and it's just a matter of the screen being powered off but the system is actually awake that's a bad time to find out uh, after the fact right the type of peripherals that are connected, external drives, USB drives, if a logon is active, in most cases, a digital camera or audio recorder dedicated for physical evidence collection are equipped with new and blank media. So you're gonna be narrating and talking through this, right? Now you can use smartphone features for informal physical evidence collection. That's the default now. I mean, smartphones are so handy, right? But that's a problem if the scope of the investigation changes to formal or public investigation, because now the status and health of your smartphone becomes open for challenge. How many of you want to put your smartphone on a witness stand in front of an opposing forensic expert? Is there anybody here in our class today that would feel comfortable handing over your smart smartphone to say, yeah, no, I recorded what we were doing with my smartphone. Oh, okay, let me see your smartphone. How many of us would be comfortable doing that? Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? You're gonna to wanna to have a dedicated video camera or digital camera with a video capacity. You're gonna to wanna to have audio. You can have an audio recorder uh, with tapes, right? but you want to, or digital, right? Digital audio recorder, where you can annotate things and narrate as you're taking action. If someone else has conducted the live acquisition of physical evidence, then you are only concerned with a static acquisition, purely digital. But there may be cases where you have a question about the artifacts or exhibits and you have to satisfy those questions. The only way to do that is to fall back on the recording, the record, right? The digital audio recording or the digital video recording. And you can't go back and say, hey, can I borrow your smartphone? I need that uh, video record of what you did last week in the office when someone was fired and now they're suing us. Everybody get what I'm saying? Do yep. not use your smartphone unless it's informal. The only problem is a lot of times informal becomes formal when it changes and then you're screwed. And then your smartphone becomes part of what's examined on the witness stand. Everybody get what I'm saying? I need each of you one at a time to unmute your microphones and respond please. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Yes. yes. Okay. Kareem. Yes. Thank you. Yep. All right. I appreciate it.
One thing that is critically important is objectivity, right? So whoever is conducting the live acquisition of physical evidence, it's critical that there's no familiarity or premature conclusions or bias, right? So if you're close to the situation, if uh, in the scenario you're performing, if you know these people and their friends and family, you can't participate. It has to be somebody else that does this. Remember that the innocence or guilt of a suspect is for the courts to decide. So if you're involved in the incident handling, you have to remain objective and you can't, can't be swayed. It's actually a bad sign if the people in the arena are volunteering additional information, right? If they're if they're no, they're so helpful, and they just they just want you to know this. Oh, this this person is such such a you know such a headache to deal with, and they just they just offer opinions openly. It's important for you to have or to rehearse rehearse a protocol to respond to stuff like that. Yes. Uh, we're going to consider other factors in the case at a later time. Right now, we're concerned about preserving any digital evidence. And in order to do that, we're gonna need people to stay clear. And uh, we'll check in with you later this, you know, later in the process, okay? And if somebody keeps standing there and they keep blathering, you want to excuse themselves. You tag in someone to clear the workspace. That's what's required sometimes, okay? And if you can't do that, you have to shut it down. You have to ba you basically go back to the, you know, the authorities in the situation and say, look, we have a situation here and um, you're not, we're not gonna be able to conclude objectively anything that's going on unless you tell people to just, you know, clear the area, give us some space to work, okay? Yeah, so live acquisition, you gotta understand that there are some people that could be involved in the scenario and they're actually party to it and they could be trying to corrupt or invalidate the data, right? So it's critical that when you observe active screens that nothing is changed. You're allowed to bump a mouse or nudge it, but you don't wanna click a button. So you can move, you can hover a mouse pointer over a feature on screen, but you don't click it. If you do anything in terms of actions with the mouse, where a program opens or closes, that could, that could basically change the contents of RAM. So if you use alt tab to view active applications, you can cycle into them without altering the current state of the programs, right? So what am I talking about? I'm gonna hold down my alt key and tap tab. Can everybody see what I'm doing here? Is it showing my tab screen? Yeah. You can see my tab screen? Yeah. All right, so I can select, here's one active window. Here's another active window. Here's another active window. I'm not altering uh, the activity or whatever just because I'm doing that. Each tab of a browser can be selected for viewing, although no tabs should be closed or new tabs opened. Now, I'm just talking in general practice terms, okay? So as you're working through a live screen, uh, you don't wanna resize windows, you don't wanna move them. All you're doing is displaying them without changing what's viewed. So if a logon session is locked, you coordinate with tech leadership to conduct a brokered or temporary change of an, a user account for an unlock provided a record of the authorization is logged and made part of the case evidence. So they'll eat you alive in court if, if they find out, well, yeah, Joe was on the help desk. Yeah, Joe authorized, Joe changed the password. 
Yeah, but Joe was just the guy on the help desk. Did Was Joe aware that you were conducting a digital forensic investigation? No. Was Joe part of the authorization? Um, were they, was he part of the line of authority? The line of authority? No, it's just Joe on the help desk. Well, do we know if Joe is involved? I mean, he used to date this person. Hello, right? That's the kind of stuff you gotta think about. A user returning to an active system after this change has been made, all right, so after the change has been made, uh, an active user coming back to the system can be discreetly managed to avoid needless alarm or suspicion. So this is where coordinating with the leadership or the line of authority is important. If you were to change someone's password to view an active system temporarily, right? Temporarily change the password. When they call into the help desk, you want the leadership of the tech department to step in. Oh, we were doing some maintenance. Yeah, this is this is Tim. I'm the IT manager. Uh, we were conducting some maintenance and working some system uh, assessments. And um, in this case, we needed to reset a password. And uh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Let me go ahead and and uh, coordinate a temporary password with you, and then you can put you can put uh, a new password in there, right? So it's, it's good to have somebody that's ready and queued up and understands, right? Now, in other cases, it doesn't matter because if you have a person who's resigned or left the organization, uh, changing the password after the fact for that user account, if they've left the screen active and they've just cleared, you know, that account is still, still in the mix, right? So you could, you could reset the password and uh, collect the evidence and then you're, that's gonna be logged. A password reset is gonna be logged. Any questions about, about this part of the live acquisition process? So as you're collecting evidence, there are five groupings of evidence common on most devices and computer systems that warrant uh, immediate or more prompt attention than others, right? So you need to know the pecking order or the volatility of evidence. Some evidence is more volatile or ephemeral. The word ephemeral means it's a vapor, right? So unless the collection is made a priority before other tasks, there's a greater chance it could be lost forever. So here's a summary of each by decreasing order of volatility. Okay, active memory, CPU content, static RAM cache, the process table, kernel stats, ARPA routing tables, right? This is, this is information that's in active memory and the closer it gets to the CPU, the more volatile it is. So typically the, the tipping point here is RAM, okay? So when you get to DRAM, uh, the contents of DRAM can change in, in an instant. And anything that's closer to the CPU than DRAM uh, is even more volatile. There are tools that can capture the content, the, the digital information uh, that's live, but typically those, typically those tools have to be loaded in the system tray. I'm talking about end case or uh, other forensic utilities. Those would start up when the system is running and it's a part, it's a part of the active security measures and, and information systems management profile for each system or device. You'd find it in the system trail the same way you'd find information about, you know, Windows Defender or other active measures. So that kind of acquisition is possible only if you have that stuff staged ahead of time. Um, capturing that information from a distance 
without those tools being in place to begin with is possible in theory, but not, not very uh, commonplace. I notice here this is misspelled. It needs to be cis internals. So cis internals, there are effective utilities to access the internals of an operating system. And one suite of tools is called sys internals for Windows, right? And this is, this is uh, free out on the open internet. You can glean a whole variety of information with live data on a system. Um, however, these kinds of tools are typically used to help troubleshoot and, and work uh, like forensic support in a troubleshooting scenario. And, and so we're talking about an informal case. So sys internals would not be an ideal tool to capture the active contents of RAM uh, if, if the legal implications were profound, like industrial espionage or uh, you know, a career changing termination at a, at a corporation or a security violation for the government, right? So group two is also dependent on the ability to run stuff in the system tray. So, so you'd have to have end case, it's the same principle. You'd still have to have specialized tools active on the system in order to capture the contents of RAM. And, um, and that's not always possible. So, so group one and group two are dependent on the, the use of specialty forensic tools as a part of the technology environment. It's the swap file contents that you can harvest uh, that don't require a lot of, uh, you don't have to have special tools. You don't have to have stuff preloaded on the system in order to be able to do that. It's, it's group three that's the tipping point, the swap file contents. Swap file memory is another word for page, page file memory. So when you hear the word swap file, that's the same as paging memory or virtual memory. And that's what we were talking about previously. Um, so I hope that's, that's a little better clarity about how this works. It's group three contents that are actually in informal scenarios, um, a good starting point, unless you already have the other expensive um, system applications running and active in the system tray. So Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, um, research and development laboratories, they would have end case, they would have um, an investment in the system tray tools that would make group one and group two uh, data recovery possible. Um, and if you performed group two recovery by loading an application, it would only be valid for a system that has huge amounts of RAM because in loading the tool into memory to capture the memory, you're actually overwriting a portion of the memory. So what am I saying? Uh, if you have a busy system that's multitasking and it has four gigs of RAM, and then you load a RAM capture utility in there, there's a good chance you're overwriting the most active and relevant portions of the data that you wanna capture in the first place by loading the RAM capture tool. It's kind of a catch 22. So that paradox is important to understand. However, the recent activity that may have been parked in temporary disk space with the swap file, that's a gold mine. So in terms of common practice, this is again, a tipping point. Are, are there any questions about what we've shared at this point? No questions. Okay. So when you're capturing, when you're capturing disk data, if you're capturing disk data, it's important to make sure that, that um, and this is an emerging challenge, there's a new style of data storage. So, 
Swap file contents work when you have a system with RAM and a traditional hard disk, okay? And this has been around for decades. In recent years, uh, industry has created a new type of flash memory that works, it's as fast as RAM or it, it approaches speeds and performance like RAM, but it's persistent. So when the power goes off, it, if you were to create a hybrid between solid state devices, like, like an SSD drive, and, and then you were to fuse it with RAM so that it was fast, uh, but it was as large as the SSD, and uh, when you turn the power off, it's still good, you'd have something that's referred to as cross point or optane. This is a, a memory innovation that has, has the potential to change the basic architecture uh, instead of having a system that has discreetly separate RAM and discreetly separate hard disk. Uh, in the not too distant future, we could have, and this is just a prediction on my part, we could have a case where uh, new servers or new client devices and systems could be designed to use this Optane or Crosspoint memory. So it's as fast as RAM, but it's permanent, like SSD memory. That would pose a challenge because um, a system like that, you'd have to kind of change the priority for how this works. The whole premise of page file memory is based on the idea that you have separate volatile dynamic RAM that loses its data when the power is turned off. And you have only so much of that because it's expensive. So RAM is expensive and, and it's hard disk space is cheaper. So you write the contents of RAM temporarily to hard disk, dedicated hard disk space. The sectors of hard disk that are more, more quickly accessed, you know, on the front of the disk sectors. That whole conventional way of uh, operating is changed in this environment. So I just want you to be aware that page file memory may not exist. And it, it may be a different scenario altogether for systems that use cross point or Optane. Um, so whole disk and partition image captures are routinely performed after the live acquisition is completed. So what are we saying? It's a common practice to pull a hard disk or the entire system and then to work the static acquisition afterwards, right? So if you can't, if you can't manage to extract an entire disk partition during the live acquisition, it's something that you can do for static. Now we're almost finished with this review, so I'd like to keep going and then close. The last two groupings of digital evidence collection are typically static acquisition. So if you have the hard disk on hand and it's been collected, then you can capture an entire disk image. So when you're dealing with whole disk partition and image capture, we're talking about disks now, that's the fourth grouping, right? And this is something that's done. It's not live on location. It's after the fact. So that static acquisition, you, you don't have a time crunch. You're not, you're not holding up the workflow of the office. You, you tend to have more time to, um, to do that kind of thing, right? So there are three important requirements to preserve uh for any data stored in a file on a disk so the actual data contained by the type of file the application related that's metadata right and the file system criteria that was used to store it. so in order for you to be able to operate effectively we get back we come full circle you have to you have to understand which file system is used you have to make sure that you preserve the metadata right and that includes things like GPS coordinates and, you know, the, the login, the owner, the login that created it, the account that, that cr the creator owner, right? Actual data contained by the type, you know. So the last one is alternate stores of critical data. You have 
this category of data acquisition that becomes very tedious. Things that are out in the cloud or online, you have to have, because, because there's an account that often is required to access that data, it gets, it's complicated and it takes time. So grouping, the fifth grouping for data acquisition that would, that would require, you, you wouldn't have to do this on site in the office live, that could take uh, quite a while. Uh, you might be lucky, but oftentimes you have to be able to access online accounts in order to be able to access the online stores. So Dropbox, SharePoint, Teams, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, anything in online environments, you know, this is kind of like the last group of data that needs to be collected. Of course, this is where you'll find a lot of motive means and opportunity information, especially when it comes to the motive side of things and means, you know, um, Facebook posts, Instagram stuff. That's, that's uh, much of what you'll glean there, okay? So you have specific file formats that require the application just to be able to access. That's a curveball. You have to be able to have those applications in order to be able to extract or uh, acquire that data. And that can be expensive. Who wants to buy all of the Adobe suite or AutoCAD? Well, you might not have a choice if some of your clients or customers use that, right? So, that concludes our review of the two uh, types of acquisition, live and static, and the different groups of data in terms of volatility. Uh, if you would, go ahead and review the rest of the section here up until the pages of the textbook that talk about seams. Are, are, are there any questions before we, any questions, comments, or observations based on the material presented today? No, not any that I can think of. Okay. Thank you again for joining us and we'll see you later today and we'll see you in the next class. If you run into a snag with your solution, let us know.